Hi, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to you all for taking the time to be here. Uh, my name is Ben, with my colleagues Adam, Megan, and Alan. Uh, we're here to talk to you about our ideas to help set a smart pace uh, for the state of Connecticut. Uh, just a brief overview of what we want to discuss today. First, we want to go over the concept of demand response, which is central to both of our recommendations. Dive a bit deeper into the CPACE program and the SMARTE program, uh, which is what our recommendations center around, and then talk about implementation, benefits, and risks. So before we get any deeper, let's talk about demand response. What is demand response, uh, and how does it actually work in practice? Um, demand response is effectively a mechanism where utilities can actively control uh, demand on the grid versus its traditional role of simply finding enough supply to meet demand wherever kind of it may lie. Um, the way demand response actually works in practice is think of a hot summer day. Everyone's got their AC on max, getting to about 3 or 4 p.m. when the grid is coming under a bit of stress. Uh, the utility has two options. Option one is it can send a signal out to a carbon intensive uh, natural gas or oil peaking plant and say, we're going to need you to turn on and activate in an hour or two and supply electricity to the grid. Or option two, under a demand response scenario, is they can send a signal to a portfolio of properties that are involved in a demand response program with the utility and say, properties, we need you to lower your electricity consumption for the next couple of hours to help us balance supply and demand. Um, so that's essentially demand response in a nutshell. Um, one of the main challenges with demand response is the uh, deployment of smart devices that are able to receive that signal from the utility. So think of a Wi-Fi enabled uh, HVAC system or a Wi-Fi enabled water boiler. You need enough equipment out there to be able to receive that signal from the utility and participate in a demand response program. Um, that kind of concept is central to our recommendations for CPACE and SMART. Um, so our challenge was to start with a program currently uh, operated by the Connecticut Green Bank and to expand it to enhance the financial viability of the Connecticut Green Bank. So we have chosen to expand the CPACE program because partially it was the most financially stable of the programs as well as one of the most successful. So the way that the CPACE program works is Connecticut Green Bank works with capital providers to deploy money uh, to customers that allows them uh, to install significant improvements to improve the energy efficiency of their uh, commercial properties. Um, so right now, uh, they work with contractors to install those devices, and then they receive payment, uh, uh, they pay back the loan over time. Uh, so our change is just to add demand response as a feature to that CPACE program. The way that we're going to do that is to allow them to also enroll smart home type devices inside of their commercial properties and reduce the payment period for those devices, partially because the significantly reduced capital expenditure associated with these uh, types of devices as opposed to more significant capital improvements like solar panel installations. Uh, and in doing so, demand response actually provides an additional source of funding that improves the financial viability of the CPACE program as well by allowing an additional source of financing when first the devices are enrolled in the demand response program and also when events occur, this means that the loans are even more secure because there's a separate uh, payer uh, to the entities. Uh, so we can ensure that these loans are going to be paid off and in an even shorter period, allowing for additional capital to be deployed by the CPACE program while maintaining a 6% rate of return for our investors, making it an attractive asset class uh, for our investors. And thinking about um, IPC in terms of how it um, is also utilizing the same uh, legacy of programs that it inherited from uh, CGB, um, one of the programs that we thought was the mo one of the most attractive and applicable to be able to utilize the same framework was a smart e program, which um, very much runs analogously uh, to the um, CPACE program, but focused more on a single household uh, residential properties. Um, and so this is a program that the creation of IPC um, inherited from, uh, from the Connecticut Green Bank, and it utilizes um, two mechanisms to um, provide uh, for capital expenditures for these um, households, both through a loss reserve program as well as um, interest rate buy-down to make um, home modifications uh, for savings 
uh, for energy efficiency savings and uh, for other kind of green related modifications. Um, so in terms of our implementation, uh, we similarly are uh, implementing the, the demand response into uh, the Smart E program, uh, which would both um, increase the um, return to the consumer um, from the, the utilities companies, and also then provide a mechanism for these customers to be able to um, both pay back uh, the loans for the uh, expenditures, as well as um, being able to then um, restore the capital to the capital providers, as well as um, IPC. <coughs> So then we made sure to look at all of the stakeholders who would be affected by these changes. So we looked at the customers first and foremost. So the customers, by enrolling in demand response programs, they're benefiting from low cost financing for these energy saving programs, but they're also, we're looking at a way that we can directly reach them and we're giving them a positive cash flow on their investment. So they're getting money back by enrolling in the de demand response program. So this enables them to be better off from the very beginning. So this also uh, impacts the contractors, who are another big stakeholder. One of the problems with these programs is you have to get buy-in. So the contractors would benefit from this because you have a larger runway of projects available to them, which in turn allows them to grow their businesses and essentially at the end of the day makes it so that they're creating more jobs for the state of Connecticut because you're losing, using local contractors. So the policymakers of Connecticut would also benefit from both of these programs, including demand response, because they don't have the budget to fund the Connecticut Green Bank or IPC. So making these changes allows us to be more financially viable without additional money from the state of Connecticut, which means the state of Connecticut doesn't need to raise taxes for us to implement the Green Bank's mission. So, and they get jobs out of it. So, and the capital providers would be incentivized to join these programs because they're getting more attractive rates of return and they're having less of a problem with the viability of the loans because they're going to have a better guarantee of a payback. And they're also going to look at, you're going to be able to partner with community providers like community banks and credit unions, so you're expanding the base of people available to participate. So, implementation benefits for both IPC and the Connecticut Green Bank you're looking at um, a scale for more, you've got the, the mush, so you've got municipalities, universities, um, hospitals, so you've got a wide variety of places that can do CPACE, and you've also got low and middle income families who, there you have a lot of people who are underserved in the state of Connecticut. So looking at the number of homeowners and single family units, you have about 176,000 low income um, homeowners and about 161,000 moderate income homeowners. So installing Smart Pace would allow you to reach these homeowners and then also expand into the municipality um, across the state of Connecticut, into the region, and hopefully nationwide. So we, looking at these benefits, we also have to look at the risks. So lastly, you know, uh, the biggest risk for CPACE would be the reluctance for um, customers, the building owners, to enroll in demand response programs. So in order to mitigate that risk, we would look at how we could um, implement better customer education initiatives. So that's one of the pillars, you know, innovate, educate, and activate for the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, so that goes into the second problem that we, saw, we identified was that there's an added layer of complexity to the program. So you would have to look at how you would track the demand response payments and how those actually um, positively affected your program. Um, Smart E has problems with, um, you know, if the rate changes, we based our analysis on the 2.75% rate today, but these are longer term loans. You'd have to look at adjustable rate loans or um, chaining them to the federal fund rate if that adjusted and we haven't went back to a situation where we raised interest rates. Um, and lastly, um, the Smart E program, you know, being a charity, um, they do have to work about bureaucratic hurdles. Connecticut is made up of a number of different jurisdictions, so if you're going to expand past the state of Connecticut, you have to look at how you can make sure this pilot program is successful for programs nationwide. Thank you, Tima. <laughs> Questions? Yes, Shisani. So first, thank you for, for the presentation, and I think as all of us, you know, realize the short amount of time that you had to pull all of this together, it is pretty amazing, so thank you. Uh, my, my question is related to the demand response because I do remember my energy company coming back with something similar a couple of years ago. I don't think I got any credits that I built though. 
Um, but, you know, I, I question what is the um, long, long term of this? You mentioned solar panels and how expensive they can be, but when you think of climate change and the extremes that we're getting, um, up to what point can demand response really be the solution? Because when it's hot, you want an AC in your home, you don't want someone cycling off. So is, is there a time frame where you say this is a temporary solution and then a, then a longer term response, or is this your long term response? Yeah, I think where we'd answer that is we view demand response as a way to shade the peak demand from the normal kind of electricity uh, daily demand profile of, of, of electricity, especially on peak days. And I think it's a very, uh, thinking about air conditioning is a very tangible way to think about it, but another way to think about it is things like lighting. On a very hot day, this building could dim its lights a little bit. I, I worked at a company where that was the case on hot summer days. They left the AC as it was because people didn't want to be hot, but the lighting went down by a certain certain amount to allow uh, them to kind of provide some of that demand back to the grid. I think it's a fair point, though, that longer term, this is a peak shaving mechanism and not a be-all and all solution to climate change. But I think one of the important characteristics is the uh, peaking resources that exist on the grid today, the ones that are dispatchable when the grid really needs it, tend to be very carbon intensive. They're oil based, they're gas based, they're very expensive and very carbon intensive. So this is a way for the utilities to not only save money, uh, but also shape some of that kind of peak uh, carbon emission that comes with uh, the grid um, on a kind of a, a normal operating basis. So it's a fair point that I that's going to help think about. So you just mentioned the word utilities for the second time. Um, it seems to me that they're the primary beneficiaries of the DR program. To what extent did you guys have time to look into utility adoption of DR, how this program could integrate with Northeast Utilities and uh, other electricity providers, and whether they're uh, adaptable to this kind of program and be done in real time? Yeah, sure. Great question. It's something that we, we looked into as well. A um, couple comments. One is, the uh, ISO New England, which is the grid provider for the entire New England region of which Connecticut's part of it, uh, has implemented demand response as part of its capacity planning process. But importantly, specific to the state of Connecticut, um, Eversource and UIL are in the final stages of piloting demand response. It's been one of the 10 pillars of Connecticut's load management um, kind of plan going forward was implementing demand response. So both the UIL and Eversource have finished piloting in between 2019 and 2021 have plans to, to roll this out across across the entire state. So we think it's a particularly interesting time to be pitching this idea because the utilities are really ready to, to deploy this on a, on a wider scale basis and the region seems to be participating as well. So it appears, and by the way, also thank you for a great job on doing it in a very swift period of time. Uh, it appears that your, your model essentially gives all the benefits of the demand response to the financing as opposed to sharing it with the homeowner or the, the property owner in the commercial case. What, what does that balancing act like? I mean, why did you choose to go that direction? And is there a benefit potentially of sharing that so that you get actually more take up? Because uh, savings, up, you know, accrue to the individual or the company. Yeah, uh, so I'll take that. Uh, so especially with the IPC program, uh, the primary focus on that was getting as many units installed as possible into areas of the, the state where they normally wouldn't be able to access it for financial reasons. Uh, so on those types of projects, we're trying to not take a, a financial loss, uh, so that's how we came up with the 2.74% uh, interest rate, but we are trying to expand to as many locations as possible. Uh, for the commercial property assessments, we think that there's a huge benefit to passing those on to the co uh, consumers uh, who, uh, as an additional benefit, uh, to enhance, again, uh, their existing energy supplies. So the benefit to the utility in part is, uh, is reduced load demand, uh, meaning, they, again, they're, they're paying the same amount of money that they would previously be paying for that load response uh, directly to the consumer, but ultimately this means a overall reduced energy burden for the state as a whole. Uh, and that would also then allow us to scale this program even better because as you enroll more devices in demand response, you get a greater and greater benefit. Uh, the other benefit that we get in Connecticut is reduced emissions. And that's not accounted for in any of the financial models, but the state of Connecticut has a lot uh, of uh, capital expenditure associated with climate change and the threat thereof. So I think although the direct financing 
at least in the short term, is primarily going to be given to the customers that are using our products. Uh, it's also going to ultimately benefit not just the utility, but also the state as a whole. Uh, Peter, just a, a cost benefit question. So, what's the cost to implement CPACE and SmartWay recommend, and then what's the economic return? Sure. Uh, I don't think that there's a significant expansion in terms of the cost to implement, especially because the energy uh, utility provider is already uh, implementing demand response uh, as an initiative of their own. Uh, the additional marketing expenditure, I think, is going to be relatively minimal just to inform people uh, that now smart home devices are a part of the existing program. Uh, so I think that the upfront costs uh, can mostly be packaged in to the existing program's uh, costs of operations. Uh, so I don't think there's going to be significant switching costs uh, since these are programs that are already in place and part of the Connecticut you know, Green Bank as well as IPC. And then how about the income? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So in terms of, uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was saying, so for demand response <laughs> income, it can be meaningful um, for a typical multifamily unit, say 200, 200 apartments or so, they can earn upwards of twenty thousand dollars a year uh, in incremental income from being enrolled in a demand response program. And that's based on the Conex program in New York, which has been very successful. Um, so I think that the incremental cost to Adam's point uh, is fairly small because you've got the infrastructure in place with C phases and stuff. Come back to the uh, well, I mean, it would be a quicker capital return cycle for the Green Bank because yes. everything is the same. You've got energy savings from the new equipment plus incremental payments from the demand response program. So if you look at this on a purely incremental basis, we think it's the same as CPACE is currently, which is already self-sustaining and viable, a viable plus incremental payments from the demand response program. So on a purely incremental basis, uh, we think that the, the risk award is certainly favorable. Jane, last question. I think that these smart devices um, can be great and, and should be used, but there's some uh, cyber security risk. So did you think about that and talk about that during your project and, and what would happen if, uh, you know, if there was a cyber attack? Um, we actually have sort of talked about in the real world what a demand response uh, looks like. And actually my company today, the HVAC person came in and I asked about what would it be like if I had a, a wireless device here so that we could adjust it. Um, and he told me in a commercial space, because I asked, I said, is that going to be a problem? And he said, the bigger problem with commercial space is you have to look at if you want different temperatures in a bigger space. So you would obviously need to make sure that you were not harming the, like if you're using a university and they had something that it was connected to their Wi-Fi network or a municipality, you didn't want to use your, your governmental entity like that. I think you would just have to, as across the board, everyone is looking at cyber security risks and these plans and how to look at the security of your network. You would have to make sure that before you hook it up that it is firewall off and as a separate server or something along those lines. So you're, you're acknowledging the risk, but it should be mitigated by just being, being mindful and, and monitoring it. Smart about for your smart devices. <laughs> what, it, what it has access to. Thank you, Kimai.